hello and welcome to using comics to teach tough topics my name is holly dotson and i'm the education coordinator for comic book legal defense fund cbldf is a nonprofit, and we are uh, our mission is to defend first amendment rights for everyone who loves and enjoys comic books creators educators readers we are here to support the first amendment rights for comic books and we are a small organization that's directly supported by contributions of our members. Um, if you have a monetary contribution, if you're able to make a monetary contribution, please do so. If not, support us in other ways. View our webinars, uh, follow us on Twitter and other social media outlets. Our webinar series is intended to provide information and resources, practical advice and strategies to educators and librarians to help you incorporate comic-based curriculum and programming in your classrooms and libraries, and also to help retailers better serve their communities as well. Um, before we get into our questions today, and our, our, we will, I want our panelists to introduce themselves. We have two wonderful folks joining us, and I guess we'll start with Tony. Uh, hi, please? everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Weaver, Jr. Um, I am the founder and executive director of Weird Enough Productions. Weird Enough is a nonprofit organization that uses superheroes and comic books for literacy and social emotional learning uh, in schools, libraries, and after school programs around the country. Uh, we have a platform called Get Media Lit, uh, where we kind of take our comics and partner them with lesson plans and curricula that can be implemented in the classroom in as little as 10 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick screen here. If you go to if you go to getmedialit.com, uh, you'll have the opportunity to kind of look at some of the comics that we have. We have a library uh, ranging a variety of topics that are standards aligned, uh, not only with Common Core, but uh, also with Castle as well. Uh, so really excited to be here. Thank you for being here. Oh, me? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, my name is Dr. Katie Monin. Uh, I've written eight books about teaching comic books and graphic novels. Uh, you can find them on Amazon. I also write a, a column for um, Diamond Bookshelf, which I've been writing for 10 years. So I think there's a couple hundred lesson plans on Katie's Corner, graphic novel reviews for schools and libraries. Uh, currently, I have the cool, super rad opportunity to write teaching guides for DC Comics. So I'm really excited about that. And lastly, I just started my own pop culture education consulting business called Why So Serious Productions. Awesome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So to get started, let's talk about what we mean when we say tough topics. Yeah, to me in, in, in schooling right now, I, you know, we're not only, it's not tough topics, we're living during a different literacy age that we, than we've ever expected. It's the greatest communication revolution since the printing press. So, you know, I think these tough topics are compounded by the education system not being as contemporary as it should be, modeling the outside world with what's in schools. Uh, but to me, tough topics are always the ones um, that I think parents want to shy away from for whatever reason and don't really look at and give the chance. Um, so any of those conversations that make people feel a little bit uncomfortable, I think we'll talk about today. Um, I think I have a lot of different thoughts about what constitutes a tough topic because my belief is that every topic is tough for someone. Um, and normally one of the things that make topics tough is the fact that we don't talk about it. Uh, so something that could easily be solved with a conversation or a dialogue suddenly becomes something that's tough to address because even though we should have talked about it like three years ago, um, now you're in the eighth grade or the ninth grade and you only pick, you've picked up everything that you know about it from random conversations with your friends that are just as uneducated as you and long unverified Facebook comment threads. <laughs> so um, I think that when I, when I think of tough topics, it, it really varies from community to community. Uh, but, I, but I think that we should treat tough topics the way that we do uh, all topics. We, we treat them uh, with reverence. We recognize that they're important uh, and we kind of try our best to uh, give nuanced representation of those topics so that the students can develop healthy thoughts and ideas around them. Awesome, very good. 
Um, I would like to, to add to that we are talking about topics that um, many of the books that include these topics or address these topics are the very books that are challenged, which is why we are talking about them today. Um, so what are some advantages of using graphic novels or comics to teach topics that, such as we we're talking about? Um, in what ways might a graphic novel be more useful than a prose work? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, I would say that the, you know, in the education world, we've talked about multiple intelligences since 1983. Have we really activated that with the literature we have in classrooms? Mm, I don't think so, so much yet with graphic novels. It's on its way. Um, but basically, I think people need to understand that when you read with a graphic novel, you're reading verbal linguistic literacies and visual spatial literacies. So you get two opportunities to come to the story and literally see it and interpret it and read the text and interpret it. And I think that's just a powerful combination that mo many parents might be missing about graphic novels. Yeah, I, I echo everything that the doctor says. She has eight books about this. Right? <laughs> um, so from a, from, a, from a pure like kind of pedagogy perspective, there are a lot of uh, kind of inherent benefits and advantages that graphic novels and comic books have. I think that from an emotional perspective, because social emotional learning space is kind of where, where, where I tip my hat. Um, there is something that is very profound in a graphic novel where from the moment you open page one, your student sees a person. There is a person. In prose, we kind of get the opportunity to make that person in our heads and there, there's valid benefit to that. But when we're talking about a difficult topic, especially topics that students themselves aren't keen on or have experience with, graphic novels have transformative power to allow students to connect with someone that is totally different from who they are and different from a person that they would make in their head. Because normally when we make people in our head, like we normally make people that we align with that are similar to us in some way. But when you open that graphic novel, the character is right there. This is the person that we're going to be spending the next couple of chapters with. Um, and that, that makes talking about topics that students might not necessarily have experience on. Um, it makes it easier because they have something to reference and it pushes them because they don't have the opportunity to play the game on their own terms. They're forced to kind of be in this situation with the person. That's yeah, both of those I would like to add. I think that's um, with the social emotional learning when we, especially if we see someone who is not like us and they're going through things and, and they're experiencing things that we do experience, then it automatically leads to empathy. And that's a really powerful thing. Cause it's, it, it's, Empathy is not something that you can necessarily teach someone uh, very easily, but that it, it, this is a format that leads to that um, in a very um, decisive way, in a very uh, easy way, gotcha. not decisive, but yeah. Um, when using graphic novels to teach difficult topics, what are some techniques or accommodations um, that might prevent or preempt controversy? Because we're talking about how these topics these are the topics that um, <clears throat> that might lead to parents challenging a work um, that, that at least they're, 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 they, they're an uncomfortable zone. How can we present these and how can we use graphic novels to present these um, that will preempt a challenge possibly? I think, I mean, the first thing I like to do is tell parents and students the history of literature and what has been taught in classrooms and how it got that way, which really started with the US government in 1890. And they hired a committee of 10 to decide what all English literature classes should include. And it was uh, chaired by the president of Harvard named Charles Eliot. And uh, he was a white guy, president of Harvard, very, you know, small, unique perspective, value his perspective. But he's, at the end of the day, he said, students should read everything I have on my five foot bookshelf, which was all white, you know, white American and white British men. Um, and, you know, from there on through the 20th century, we've made great leaps and bounds to teach more visual literacies. The, um, the first film to the uh, first film in classrooms occurred in 1933. So I think it's like pretty that perspective, like we have been doing this. We've been valuing um, multi-literacies. However, you know, I think post 9-11, you know, what happened during the American school day, to me at least, 
uh, you know, my students reacted two ways in one split second. One was they saw that second uh, plane hit the tower and one kid started crying and saying, my dad's there. Another kid, as horrifying as it is, as it is but he's a good kid. Uh, he's 30 something now. But anyways, he uh, said, great, best movie explosion over ever. They're all dead. And that's why we need to teach kids how to read the visual languages, not on just any screen, but in books and literature and all of that stuff. So putting that a little bit in perspective is how I like to uh, start. Mm -hmm. I think that we have the ability to avoid controversy and avoid pushback when implementing graphic novels for tough topics uh, by giving them the same reverence that we would give traditional prose. Uh, so something that I still think happens with graphic novels, which I think is part of why we haven't been able to tap into the power of the medium yet, is that we're still very literal with graphic novels. We can read a book, like we can read a prose novel like, uh, like Fahrenheit 451 and say, okay, we're going to use this to talk about censorship. But if we want to use a graphic novel to talk about racism, we have to go and get a graphic novel explicitly where racism is happening. Like we, can't, we don't give graphic novels the same opportunity to be allegories and use as long form metaphors as we do traditional prose. And I think that's a way to kind of avoid controversy. Like if I were to give an example, that's why I'm kind of glad these posters are back here. So this back here is one piece. If you don't know about, check it out. Highest grossing manga ever last 20 years. There's a scene in one piece where there's a character uh, that creates a battleship. And that battleship is stolen and used uh, to destroy and cause tragedy in his hometown. And what his mentor says to him is, um, I know that that wasn't your intention when you made it, but when you created this thing and brought it into the world, you need to understand that you have a responsibility for what happens, for what it is used for. Um, and in 2019, when we're dealing with mass shootings and things like that, I think that One Piece is a great allegory and that scene is a great conversation to have to introduce something, uh, to introduce something around talking about the mass violence that's happening in our country uh, to our kids. Whereas if you go and get a graphic novel that's like titled something about gun control, then you're probably going to deal with a little bit of pushback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, building upon that, um, what my research has uh, found over the years is that we live we live in a modern world with a modern literacy stage. Uh, piggybacking on what Tony was saying is where uh, print text still shares the stage. I call it the Brangelina, but now that they're broke up, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> the Brangelina stage. But anyways, uh, on one side, we have print text literature, like we've always taught, that still needs to stay there. But then there's an equal sign to visual literature. Visual literature is now the co-star of the modern literacy stage. And I think what Tony uh, said as well about, uh, you know, it's, it baffles me because some of us have been doing this for 15, 20 years, talking about the literary level of graphic novels. They are literature. And mm -hmm. they think more people need to attempt to understand that before they make a judgment. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. This is good stuff. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's move on to our next question, though. What graphic or graphic novels and other books that depict tough topics may encounter resistance from parents, administrators, and even fellow teachers? Um, how do we counter such resistance? Yeah, I've written a lot in my books about, uh, you know, letters that you can send to the administration explaining the literary level, listing the history a little bit, and putting it in a better uh, 21st century perspective for educators to understand that this does belong in the classroom. The, the readers of this generation are going to be visual readers, like it or not, a decision has been made. Uh, we live in a much more visual world than we ever have. Uh, so that's kind of how I like to approach that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's a, it's, a, it, it's a battle that you fight differently depending on who you're talking to, right? So if I were a teacher and I were working, and I were working with parents, and I knew that I intended to use graphic novels in my classroom at the beginning of the semester, in my syllabus or in whatever opening communication I send to parents, there would be something there about the fact that we will be using graphic novels and citing some of the, and citing some of the research um, kind of around what, around the positive benefit that graphic novels have. When talking with other teachers, I think that's, 
a battle that really needs to be fought by teachers specifically because for the most part, teachers only listen to other teachers. Um, <laughs> teachers value the word of other teachers more than they do anybody else. So uh, to be able to speak to them as a peer and say, hey, here's what the data says. Here's what I know. Uh, there, there's someone in, in Denver named Dr. Katie Monin, and she has written eight books about <coughs> how comics can be implemented in the classroom, right? So I, I think it's one thing to prepare parents because it's something they might not be accustomed to, uh, but when it comes to teachers and, and other people in the education space, we have to show up with the data. We have to, uh, because uh, that, that, that's kind of our way to, to, to use their own words against them. If you want to be data-driven, sure, here's the data. Now let it drive your decision. I, I agree. I think, that, and I want to point out too that you know, CBLDF, a huge part of our education educational resources um, are providing um, librarians and educators with resources to help them fight these fights, to help them justify um, the use. And I've put some of those in that some particular, I put a link to all of our librarian and educator tools at the bottom there. Um, but I want to point out specifically panel power and raising a reader because both of these have specific talking points that you can say um, graphic novels, uh, provide um, students with this, this, and this. Um, they meet, they help us uh, meet the standards um, when we are teaching. Um, they help uh, create uh, higher levels of, of thinking or lead to higher levels of thinking. Um, so those resources are there as well. Just wanted to put that too. <laughs> I mean, that's the first place I point people to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, she's not kidding. Um, not like anybody doubts her, but like really that is the best place to go, uh, mm -hmm. I think, originally for uh, support on uh, the literary level of graph. I also think the connection with, you know, Tony was saying earlier, like knowing your own students, I think that's a really critical point because I'm going to bring in Why the Last Man maybe for a different audience than I would bring in Mouse and the needs that the students mm -hmm. have or the issues that they struggle with or may need to address. Yeah. And I would like to point out too, I think that when we, um, when we are talking with parents particular um, or, or anyone who, who wants to challenge uh, our, our intellectual freedom in the classroom, um, it's, it's good to, to, to be, again, inclusive in how we deal with things and, and to let them know, I understand as a parent, I understand and value um, and, and very grateful that you are interested in your child's education. Um, and, and then go to those talking points. I think it's good to start with that, uh, with, again, because parents are concerned because they care about their children. Yes. Um, and um, as a parent, I understand that. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, even offering the parent the book first is, is something that I've done. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, if you find anything you'd like to discuss, I would be more than happy to do that with you, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I just realized that my computer is not plugged in. <laughs> so I need to take care of that real quick. There we go. Now then, it was giving me its like sad face that it was about to die, which would not have been good. Oh. Well, moving right along, <laughs> um, what are some resources uh, that you recommend for teachers who are thinking about using graphic novels to teach tough topics in their classroom? Yeah, I would say uh, we've really been uh, addressing a lot of tough topics on Katie's Corner, the Diamond Bookshelf column, uh, and writing out lesson plans that are there. So there's the review, there's the elements of story, there's the lesson plans. Um, and, and, and not only my books, but I think like, uh, can you repeat the last part of that question again? Oh, yes. Um... What are some resources you, re I'm just going to repeat the question. What are some resources you recommend for teachers who are thinking about using graphic novels to teach tough topics in their classroom? So resources to help them be able to teach these, these novels. 
Yeah, I, I, yeah. So I would say uh, two of my books respond really well to that, which would be teaching graphic novels, which won some awards for that. That was weird. I, I it was like being called for the Oscars. I'm like, what? Um, <laughs> anyways, so there's curriculum in there that helps you do that. There's one piece of curriculum that's called the literate eye. And it's a visual of an individual eye that students get to look at the story through and critical lenses through their own point of view, and then label the eye with everything in the story that they see. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think DC Comics, I mean, the new DC Comics teaching guides are amazing. Um, of course, I'm a little biased because I write it, right? Uh, but, but in general, my, uh, my point of view uh, is that uh, the, the things that we're doing at Weird Enough with Get Media Lit um, are explicitly there uh, to, to help equip teachers to utilize uh, the, these sorts of things in the classroom. So we have a comic called The Uncommons. Um, and uh, the what we do with the Uncommons is that we release every uh, we release one issue a month, so a 22 page issue a month, and we have about 40,000 young people that read the comic each month, independent of anything educational. Uh, but then we take the comic and we uh, we kind of break it up into digestible pieces and uh, attach lesson plans and curricula to it. Um, on the platform, uh, we do playlists every two weeks. Um, around specific topics. So the two that are up right now are tech savvy, which is around new technologies uh, that are being developed. Uh, and then the other one is around, it's called In My Feelings, which is more around like self-image, uh, mental health awareness and things like that. Um, and we also provide opportunities for teachers to let us know what they need uh, so that we can develop lesson plans uh, and curricula kind of related to that. So if something happens on a Monday, the way that our production cycle works, I can have a comic and a lesson plan uh, by Thursday or Friday, um, really reactive to, to kind of what teachers need. I know I'm biased because like it, it's kind of my life's work, but uh, I really recommend getting me lit. Um, in addition to that, I think the, the biggest resource for implementing graphic novels in the classroom is your students. I think that your students are the are the are, are the biggest resource. Um, right now, we are kind of in this place as an industry, as educators, where there's this list of graphic novels that everybody likes, and we kind of just go grab those and use those. But I think the cool stuff that happens is when we completely ignore that list, uh, because right now, what's happening is, hmm. I want to talk about uh, this topic that's kind of touchy, so we're going to grab mouse or, ooh, there are black kids in my class, so let's read March. And it's like, that's okay, cool, I guess. But if you know that your kids are reading Dragon Ball Z and that they're hype about Dragon Ball Z, you can take the fight between Gohan, Cell, and Goku and liken it to Beowulf to to provide allegories about how consequences of father pass the son. Like, it's that simple figure out what they like, and they're probably reading My Hero Academia, Mob Cycle 100, and Demon Slayer right now. Those are probably the three things that they're reading. Um, and if you, if you look at it, just even at, at, a, at its core, I think that it is possible to grab those things that on the surface don't look like they have any educational value and draw connections between the things that you're talking about in your classroom. And I think those are going to be the things that are most effective. If you don't feel like doing all of that, get medialit.com. <laughs> I love Tony. I'm going to be all over your site now. Uh, uh, something I would add to that is also there's this wide open opportunity to do literary pairings with graphic novels. And I, th I think that's what Tony is saying as well. Um, even for traditionalists who are like a little hesitant to come to the graphic novel as contemporary literature, it, you can take your Shakespeare and Gareth Hines has interpreted Shakespeare in graphic novel form for you. Um, you know, everything like that just, uh, it, it's, it's very helpful to do the pairings because I think then students and teachers and parents and administrators can really see, uh, and especially prepare that beforehand so they can see it beforehand. So, mm -hmm. But to really see how to deconstruct literature within graphic novels, just like we always have other canonical texts. Oh, and the standards now say text plural. So if anybody's thinking we need just print text anymore, that's really not true. It says text plural. Y'all are great. I'm going to add some, some uh, information uh, for the resources that we have at CBLDF um, that will help, um, that are intended specifically to help educators and librarians uh, defend the, the choices that they make in their classrooms, and particularly um, graphic novels that 
teach tough topics. Like I said, many of these are the novels, uh, graphic novels that are being challenged, um, which is what we focus on. Um, so adding graphic novels uh, to your classroom is one which provides, um, provides educators and librarians with reviews, um, awards that have been won uh, by the books so that they can show that they have literary merit. Another is using graphic novels in education. These provide um, discussion questions and activities that will help you incorporate them that again are focused on uh, meeting um, standards. And the last one, which I have not uh, copied yet because I was listening, <laughs> listening to y'all, are the CBLDF discussion guides. And these are great, uh, not just for educators and librarians, but also for um, retailers who possibly want to have a book club uh, in their store. Um, and they also um, provide information on how to incorporate them into the classroom uh, and to justify um, why you're using them too. So we, uh, we already have a, a three questions coming in. Before we do that, I thought we would talk a bit about specific graphic novels that you might um, recommend for different topics. Um, the first one is bullying. Do you have some titles that you could suggest to our viewers for bullying? Yeah, uh, well, I think absolutely take what you can carry is a really good example of that taking place in a concentration camp in America. So, you know, something to see there. Um, I also think that the current DC Harley Quinn and Raven, or yeah, uh, Raven that came out, the new ones, they're really addressing the bullying of the superheroes in the origin stories now. And I think that's a really effective way to do that. I mean, even the new Mariko Tamaki, Harley Quinn, shows her really struggle with her emotions and how to respond to people who are picking on her. She's not the, the psychotic Harley Tw Quinn that we see maybe later. And she wrestles with some very moral decisions on how to respond uh, to bullying. And so does uh, Cami Garcia's uh, Raven. So I would think those are two very um, uh, e easy to find titles too. Okay. Um, so what I recommend um, especially when we think about bullying, I think that conversations that we're currently having about bullying are around like, oh, ha ha, someone laughing at you in the hallway. Um, but what our kids are facing today is the tangible reality that if I fall asleep on the bus, someone can put cheese whiz in my hair, take a picture, and by the time I get to school, it's been circulated around my school and kids that don't even go to my school. And I can get home and look on Twitter and see myself memed with thousands of shares and retweets. Like it's a, we are in a whole different game in terms of what bullying means. Um, and I'm looking this way because I'm looking at my bookshelf. Um, I highly recommend Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me, um, uh, another Mariko Tamaki title, um, because I, I think that it, beyond bullying, it talks about unhealthy relationships. And I think that bullying at its core is an unhealthy relationship with a person. It's a bad relationship, but it's still a relationship, right? And I, I, I think that Laura Dean uh, does a great job of talking about that with nuance and leaving it broad enough for students to make interpretations of what works best for them. Um, also, I recommend reading The Uncommons. One of our main characters uh, literally uh, is a villain initially because he was teased and bullied and decided that he was gonna uh, take uh, the, his kind of resonance and skillful nature with technology um, and leverage it to get back at the people that made him feel bad. Um, and I think that that's something that we're dealing with a lot because normally what happens is kids get bullied in real life and then they go home and get on the internet and become trolls and bully other people. And at scale, we get this system of hurt people hurting people. Um, and we talk about that a bit um, in, in the uncommons as well. Those are the two like kind of biggest recommendations that I make. Yeah, there's a new title out too called uh, Bitter Root. And it's not, it, it, it's more of, analogous or metaphorical um, about hate in general and that sort of treatment and I highly recommend it. I just did a webinar the maybe in a week, a week or two ago with uh, Sanford Green. We had a 
Yeah, yeah. We had an excellent conversation about this title. I'd look for this to win some awards this year. And I think we also need to pay attention to the history. Uh, this is a copy of Jane's World from the late 90s, early 2000s, the first LGBTQ comic that was pretty mainstream by Paige Braddock. And I, you know, she has um, love letters to Jane's World out now to kind of comprehensively pulling out the most significant stories by Lion Forge. So that's a really great title too. What about um, abuse? Do you have any titles for abuse? Laura Dean as well. Uh, Laura okay. Dean is breaking up with mm -hmm. me. Yes. Tells a story of a bunch of different characters and there's, uh, there's a lot of nuance in it. There's a lot of nuance there. I love it. Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me is by far my favorite graphic novel of the year. And I wish I could put it into the hands of teenage me because he probably would have had a much easier time. Um, I think uh, Spinning by Tilly Walden. Um, spinning definitely, uh, definitely kind of gives some context for abuse and a, a, a framework to talk about it, I feel. Yeah. I Sorry, I am just a DC guru. So I, in Mr. Miracle, there is some extensive abuse from which he cannot escape. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of these superhero stories that really isn't a superhero story. It's very relatable. Uh, but he has to escape um, Granny's uh, torture chamber. And it's horrifying, the abuse that he goes through. And he processes it with his uh, soon-to-be wife, who they have a child with throughout the graphic novel. Um, and his process is very relatable. And they don't tr try to sell the, the DC superhero type thing very much. But what they do is he wears different uh, DC superhero t-shirts. And it's almost like he's becoming his own hero while processing what has happened to him and spreading that message uh, around the universe because it takes place a little sci-fi. But what about some titles for suicide? So I'll, um, I'll say again, read The Uncommon. Okay. Um, we have a lot of uh, kind of talking points and overall context around uh, kind of suicide, suicide prevention, self-harm, how to recognize it in yourself and others, um, and how to process your kind of mental uh, well-being when you don't feel like you want to be here if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's, so uh, yeah, I read the uncommons, guys. I pr I'm biased, but it's great, I promise. <laughs> uh, for me, one of the books, uh, books that most um, got down deep and like really made me think about things, not directly about suicide, but it is, it is in, in a way, medically complicated way, um, is uh, Katie Green's Lighter Than My Shadow. Uh, I think that's a really, it's about eating disorders. It's a really intense title to even, to even read uh, because you can see what's happening and she's very open and honest, which is so fortunate for kids who come to that particular graphic novel. Uh, there was one more I had in mind. Uh, oh, I, it's Bell Yang's Forget Sorrow, uh, which is about her father's journey during World War II to escape the bombings over China. And, um, you know, he, he really gets down to the rock bottom in order to pressure through and, you know, make it out. He walks from, I think the analogy or the, the distance was he walks from about Minnesota to Florida. That's the length of the country he covers mm -hmm. by himself as World War II is kind of coming down a little bit. And he questions the suicide thing. <laughs> uh, what about some titles for racism? Yeah. So we, we did cover March. I think Tony covered right. that. Yeah. Um, again, I would say Bitter Roots for that one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just so strong. It's so yeah. strong. It takes place in Harlem. Uh, and this African-American family who's kind of estranged from each other must come together again to fight hate. Uh, so so I, love, I love that one um, a lot. And that hate, I love, I love that hate is, it becomes um, almost personified. Well, not, but it's... Yeah. It, yeah, it, it is a character itself in that book. Yes, you just, yeah, 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 yeah that's a great point. It personifies itself as a character that even gets worse and worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I also think uh, I Am Alfonso Jones is one of the best titles I've read. Um, so I think Bitter Root is, like, wonderful. Definitely uh, second that recommendation. 
Uh, the video game series Overwatch uh, has some online comics uh, that, that reference some of the events of the lore. Uh, so there's a lot about large scale discrimination uh, that, that happens in the Overwatch comics that I recommend. Um, and in addition to that, I feel like it's low hanging fruit and it doesn't go like super, super deep into it, but it's still worth mentioning. I think Miss Marvel and some of the early arcs has conversations. Mm -hmm. And the not not yeah. as deep as I like for it to go, but it does happen. What about some titles for grief? Uh, uh, Toon Books, uh, Francois Mouly and Art Spiegelman's Toon Books publication has uh, a couple titles for that for early readers, which I think is brilliant choice and how they handle mm -hmm. it is... Uh, just very well done. I don't know how else to say that. Um, there's a new title. Um, I did a webinar with him recently, uh, Andre R. Fratino, uh, called Simon Says. And basically, in Simon Says, without giving anything away, uh, Simon has lost 80 members of his family during the Holocaust, and he's the only one to survive. He witnessed his wife and children being shot. It was horrifying. Um, but the way in which he processes it, and then post end of the war, how he continues to process it is a very um, engaging and enlightening perspective on how deep those feelings were and are. Um, in terms of grief on the lighter side, highly recommend uh, Sisters by Raina Telgemeier, um, just like her kind of dealing and, and processing uh, with, the, with the reality of her parents' divorce uh, is one thing, uh, but also low-hanging fruit. But I feel like I should tell everybody that, that will listen about it. Hey, kiddo, as well, mm -hmm. um, yeah. about, process, about processing grief, especially so young. Uh, mm -hmm. Titles I recommend. And also read the uncommons. We talk about it, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. uh, the only one I would add to that is blankets. Yeah. Um, it's yeah yeah it's yeah it's very good um couple more uh topics here what about war and civil conflict war and civil conflict i you know some people think we can have enough of the holocaust stories but in in our time and place in history when people are still doubting that and be, yeah, yeah. you know being encouraged almost by various uh I don't know, organizations and or people, <laughs> just gonna be politically correct. Uh, we really need to read those. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say Son of Hitler, Simon Says, uh, of course, Mouse. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's always breathtaking. Um, and I would say Persepolis as well. Persepolis is a really good um, title that gives you the perspective from the child experiencing the story. Um, so she wrote it when she was adult through her own child perspective, which is, and I think the first page of the Persepolis is so profound because it shows the day where they went to school, the little girls went to school around age 10 and they were told to wear the veil with no abs, no context whatsoever. Um, and the meaning they had to make from that had to grow from their growing understanding of what was going on outside of them um, in the adult world. and you know, they're, they're not really using the veil appropriately on the first, first page. Um, I would recommend going and look at some of the graphic novel adaptations of Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, as I, I think it is uh, like one of my top three best animated series of all time, but the, the comic adaptations really add into it as well. And uh, the, the conversations that take place around, uh, around war, around what that does to the soldiers in the war, around what that does to the people in each of the countries that are participating in the war, different ways that people use propaganda and shift narratives to make their citizens support what their country's doing. Um, Avatar really delves into those things in a way that I think is nuanced and, uh, and, and really poignant. Tony, I don't, I don't know if this is out, but I'm just going to ask you. I agree, Avatar all the way. Uh, but also Korra, I know it's still the animated series, but have they made it any comic books? or graphic there, are. there are comic books for Korra, and there is a new Avatar comic coming out that kind of uh, chronicles uh, adult Aang and adult Zuko's Ooh. path politically to trying to bring the four nations to peace after the end of the events of the show. 
So I haven't even I haven't read the newer comic because it's not out, but I I think it's gonna be a treat. I'm excited. About it. Yeah, and these are both available in cartoons on Blu-ray or DVD if you want to watch them with your kids, and that's another literary level pairing. And I love um, I love fiction. Um, I, I know that we've again, it's great that we have uh, such wonderful nonfiction books, but I think we can do with fiction. It's like a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down and it allows, um, it allows us to think about these concepts in a way that um, is uh, less intimidating maybe if, and than when we're talking about things that are actually happening out in the real world. Yeah. I love the idea of, of Tony, that's great of using um, Avatar to talk about these things. Um, one last topic and then we'll open up for uh, questions. Um, what about some titles for sexuality, LGBTQIA issues? And well, Lauren keeps breaking up with me. <laughs> what? Lauren keeps <laughs> breaking up with me. <laughs> it's, if you notice, the books that I like are ones that are like, have a bunch of different themes kind of packed into them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's what. Uh, I would also add uh, Maya Kabebe's uh, Gender Queer. Uh, it is the most thoughtful, reflective, uh, easily approached, gently but intensely. I, I don't know how else to explain it. Mm -hmm. It's just one of the best graphic novels I think that's ever been written on the market ever. Uh, so gender issues, I mean, she thoroughly, as a child, takes time to like respect her feelings throughout her childhood and her parents just let respect her too. And it, it's a beautiful story about just chill out and let people be people and especially your children, let them be themselves. Um, I'd also highly recommend Cosmo Nights by Hannah Templer. Uh, so Cosmo Nights does a lot of conversation around LGBTQ themes, but also um, gender norms, uh, who falls into them, who doesn't, and what it means if you don't, and the fact that that's totally okay. Mm -hmm. And all of this dialogue is, uh, is, is kind of set on, on the backdrop of like space pirate gladiators. It's pretty great. It's pretty wonderful. Yeah, and again, Paige Braddock does not get enough credit. She gets a ton of credit, but she deserves more credit for Jane's world and putting it on the map uh, and being one of the first people to ever put uh, LGBTQ characters in, in comics. I'd like to add Fun Home because yes. it's brilliant. Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, it is. It's, it's yeah. brilliant. And then, um, and then Bingo Love by T. Franklin. Um, it is about um, a couple who connect when they're younger and then um, the world separates them. They get married, they have families. They come back together as older adults. And it, so it also takes, um, it, it, it's, it takes in, you know, it, it kind of addresses ageism even and the idea of sexuality at various stages of life. Um, so it's really, yeah, it's a beautiful story. Um, so let's open up for Q&A. We ha already have three here. And we will start. I have feelings about the first question. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read them out loud. It says, my students love manga such as One Piece, but are far less interested in standalone graphic novels that deal with important issues such as March. Any tips for making those non-manga titles more attractive to kids? Um, my answer there, which, which, which probably isn't what you're looking for, but I feel like it bears saying is, don't don't make the non-manga titles more attractive to kids. In One Piece, there's a character in the Straw Hat crew who's a fisherman. He's a part of a species that, that was eliminated via genocide, and he becomes a part of their crew. Like, literally, if you want to talk to your kids about racism and they love One Piece, just go talk about Jinbei. His origin story is already there. There's no reason to do mental gymnastics to make them like March when they're – like it's it's already there in what they like if you really want to include march i'd say just use them as partner text so say like hey you like one piece where there's this character in one piece that had to deal with the civil war whereas people were uh, uh were genocided as a result of hey uh very similar and an allegory to the civil rights movement which is what we're talking about in march like i think I think that connection can happen, but I question the idea that we have to go to graphic novels that are explicitly saying, hey, racism, but drawn now. 
in order to get the point across. That's an excellent point. I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, there's so many titles. If kids are interested in them, you can pick, pull out those elements of story, those themes, and pair that with the uh, general interest of what you're trying to cover as well, where, whatever titles the kids are, are into. I totally second that. Thank you. Our next question says, within the last six months, I successfully defeated a challenge to fund home at my high school. See the coverage of that situation on CBLDF website. One of the difficulties was the ease administrators had in pointing to a single image on a single page that they found pornographic. They hadn't even read the book. When I insisted that the principal read the book, he said it was a good read, but couldn't get past the one image in one panel of a 230 page book. Can you recommend any strategies for keeping censors from cherry picking images and using them out of context to justify, justify banning a book? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the first thing we need to go back and do is reflect on the books that we've taught in yeah. the last, <laughs> last couple of centuries. And yeah. the same things are in there, they're just not visual. And sometimes it's even more intense in the print text than it is in one one panel. So I think people need to move, they, they need to be a part of the 21st century and move on and realize that this is a visual reading world. We are doing, we will be doing literacy scholars posit that we will be doing the greatest disservice to students in the history of education if we do not teach them how to print text and visually read at the same time. I want to say that I recommend the difficulty in that situation where you have someone that's kind of in a uh, in, a, in a hierarchical superior role saying, uh, hey, there's this one panel in this 230 page book. Um, what should I do about it? I think, I think drawing comparisons uh, with specific pros that you know they won't challenge uh, as a means to say, well, you allow this, why don't you allow this? Like what, if we're talking about things that are pornographic, why are we talking about Macbeth at all? Why is much ado about nothing? Even, why, why do we use half of Shakespeare's Cornadal if, if the minute something becomes suggestive, it's pornographic? Um, kind of drawing, re respectfully, of course, drawing a line between those two things and saying, hey, they're literally the same thing, and you allow it in this context, but you don't allow it in the other context. Ooh, I like that. Uh, we just had another question. Yes. Uh, what strategies would you suggest for using graphic novels with students who have visual disabilities? That's a oh, great okay. question. Sorry, got a good one here. Um, I, I, I love Paige Braddock, obviously. But uh, besides her, her comics and her graphic novels, she also is the chief creative officer at the Schultz Museum. So when I went to visit uh, her and the, and the museum, get a tour, they were showing me that even back in the day, uh, Charles Schultz had worked on braille reading of his comics. So, I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> and it's been around for a while. So there are some texts that are out there like that. And so that's, that's one thing I would definitely suggest. Uh, awesome. so there are YouTube pages that do audio reading of comics. Um, primarily the readings that they do are of things from the big two, like Marvel and DC. Um, some comics, like I know Hey Kiddo has an audio book that's coming out soon, but if you have students that have visual disabilities and you want to bring in some of these graphic novel elements, what I would highly recommend is podcasts. Um, if you look at narrative-based, story-driven podcasts like Welcome to the Night Vale, um, there is a... There, you, you get the same context of they're using high-level vocabulary, there are themes that there are themes in a narrative that that evolves over time, uh, and we get to talk about language because, of course, like since they're highly produced pieces of work, when it's nighttime and they want you to know it's nighttime, there are crickets chirping, or you hear like the bristle of people's feet stepping on pine straw, right? And I think that uh, as we're having conversations about uh, uh, students kind of being able to derive context from things, that's a good way to implement it as well. All right, we have about 10 minutes left and we will give folks a little bit more time to see if anyone wants to 
ask any more questions. Uh, one mm -hmm. thing that I would add, and I would really like both of you to join me at some point, <laughs> is uh, Why So Serious Productions is going to do, be doing a podcast about pop culture education, especially with comics and graphic novels and teaching them in classrooms and all the issues kind of we've been talking about today. So that's, that's a podcast I might throw out there to be, to be made probably in the spring. Awesome. Then, um, let's see, we have one more. Not sure what you, okay. Oh, um, Gil is asking if you could restate what you said about the Braille comics because sure. there was some noise distortion on him. Yeah. Sure, sure. That could have been me. I'm wearing, t you know, <laughs> loud pants. Uh, <laughs> Pants. They're swishing. Um, anyways, uh, what I said was that uh, in de last de December, I visited the Schultz Museum, uh, which is in Santa Rosa, California, a beautiful area of the country, highly recommend. Um, and uh, while I was there, they took me into the archives. And one of the things that I learned is that Braille comics already exist. And Schultz was part of starting that movement. And they basically the characters are popped up on the page to be felt and then the writing is or sorry the braille is there as well so they can fe texturize feel uh the comics and um so they are out there thank you um another question where are the gaps in coverage um for example are there difficult topics for which the selections of graphic novels is sparse or non-existent and what topics need more coverage? That's a good question. My opinion is that I don't think that there's a gap in coverage. I think there's a gap in thinking around what's acceptable to bring in the classroom and what isn't. Um, but there are, and I say this as someone that like grew up on comics and anime and hated every required reading book that I was given post of Mice and Men. Like I think in ninth grade, I had to read of Mice and Men and I was like, oh, this is great. And after that, every other single thing I had to read from the time I graduated from high school, I was like, why? Why? I'm not interested at all. Um, I, and the things that, I, that, people, that my teachers wanted me to get from those books that are in the traditional canon, I got from stories like the posters that are on my wall. I got it from these... Uh, uh, from from these manga and from these different comic books, I don't think that there's a gap in coverage at all. I think that for every conversation that we want to have with our students, there is a comic or manga series somewhere that addresses it with poise. The only question is, are we going to bring it into the classroom? <laughs> that's the only question. Like, are you are you going to be able to have that discussion with with, with your principal? That, that's the that's the question. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with you. I'm just going to take a slightly different approach is I think what's missing. Uh, one of my books, I think it's 2014 is called teaching reading comprehension with graphic text and it's a graphic novel about teaching graphic novels and I think we need a lot more of, of stuff resource material for that mm -hmm. in graphic novel format. Uh, just, you know, preaching what we preach, you know, doing and acting mm -hmm. what we're saying out. Um, that was a really fun textbook to write. Um, and I had a really awesome illustrator who joined in me, who joined me. I think there's probably, and this is not just in graphic novels, but across the board, we need more literature that deals with mental illness in, um, in a way that's not stigmatizing or uh, that's, that's more um, open to this is part of life type thing. And I think that's just, again, across the board. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, generalized anxiety and depression and coping. And I think Raina's new book, uh, Guts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a great example. And takes on IBS. Again, something, uh, you know, it's, yeah, like it's, it's again, these things that are, yeah, uh, not always fun to talk about. Um, Gil is asking, um, Katie, do the text textualized comics communicate movement or emotion? Yes. From what I saw, yes. Okay, yes, to both. All right, and as a librarian, this is for Martha, as a librarian who did not grow up with comics and graphic novels, I struggled to keep up with the titles and make sense of arcs. 
What resources can you recommend to librarians and teachers who want to learn more and want to keep current? I got you. Let me put you on game. I got you, Martha. I'm here for you. Okay. <laughs> so if you go to your local comic shop or if you even go online, um, Diamond, who is a distributor for majority of comics from print publishers, ha uh, if you go to the comic shop, you'll see it. it's a book about this thick and it's called their previews book. And in that book, every title that a publisher that is distributed through Diamond, which is like 90% of them, is coming out with over the course of the next six months is in that previews book. And you, um, a, a lot of the time, if it's a new series, they'll include like a synopsis and like, okay, here's what's happening. If it's a series that's already happening, they'll say, okay, issue number six is coming out and they'll include a little bit about, uh, about what the story is. So if you see the issue six is coming out and it looks like something that could be intriguing for you or that you could use in the classroom, that lets you know that volumes one through five, issues one through five are already there for you to go grab. Um, that's in the comic space. For manga, I highly recommend looking at Shonen Jump, S-H-O-N-E-N, -E Jump. Uh, so Shonen Jump is a compilation magazine that consists of generally about seven to nine titles at any given point in time. And if a title is in Shonen Jump, then it means that it is one of the highest selling titles in Japan at the time. So Shonen Jump takes and um, uh, compiles the top selling manga at the moment and puts them all in this magazine. They used to distribute them in print in the U.S., uh, but now they kind of do it um, – through their site online. But what I recommend doing is going and looking at the titles that are currently in Shonen Jump, looking at the synopsis for those titles, and based on what uh, based on what you find interesting, every title that's in Shonen Jump also has standalone volumes where it's just that story, where you can go and grab it um, and, and, and look at it. And I think that, um, that th those are the two resources I recommend. What I also say is like, talk to your students. If your students like One Piece, I guarantee you they're reading other things as well. So even having a conversation and opening the conversation with them to say, I wanna read more manga, what do you got for me? Um, I think that's something that they'd be really excited about and they talk ad nauseum about it. Yeah, I, I completely agree with all of that. The thing I would like to say in response is I was never a graphic novel reader until uh, my mid twenties when someone handed me mouse and I said that, well, that's not really reading. That's a comic book. And you know, I was all snotty and English major about it. But when I sat down to read it, I thought, Oh no, this is telling a story on, on a deeper, deeper level. So I've just uh, spent a lot of time um, immersing myself in the story arcs themselves so I can catch up to everybody who had that 20 years before me. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's definitely one thing. Um, but I also think, uh, you know, comics lore is comics lore. Graphic novels in the 20th, 21st century are another thing. I mean, we're kind of splitting apart the formats and the genres to encompass a lot of different things. So I think you could follow those story arcs at um, a lot of different places. And again, there are a lot of resources on Amazon. Um, James Bucky Carter also has a really good book on uh, teaching graphic novels. My, my deeper recommendation, and I think... Um, I think Katie's going to disagree with me a little bit on this, but I would say if you're trying to get up to speed and you want to get involved, just ignore Marvel and DC. Like there's no point. They start from issue number one every couple of months. They reboot the universe all the time and low key, they get teacher's guides assigned to their stuff. But the, the things that are coming out of image comics right now, or the things that are coming out of aftershock comics right now, like aftershock has a comic called the moth and the whisper about a gender non-binary teen trying to track down their parents that are also like secret spies. And the moth and the whisper is five volumes, like five issues. It's literally go pick up this one five volume thing. Whereas if you're like, DC, I want to read Superman, which Superman action comics just broke issue 1000. I don't really know what I'm doing. You'll get lost real quick. Um, I think that some of the, some, some of the, the image stuff some, and some of the indie like smaller publishers are going to be a little bit easier for you to grab. Yeah. And I, you know, there, there is that 
difference between studying comic lore and studying graphic novels. Mm -hmm. And I would absolutely make the distinction. Yeah, I do disagree. Um, but one thing, you know, I have a little bit of a heads up on the books that are coming out from DC and they are much more relevant to middle grade and YA issues that need to be discussed that we've discussed on here. Um, I think, um, under the moon Catwoman tale by, uh, Oh, what's her name? She lives in Colorado. Um, Oh, I'm blanking. But anyway, she's absolutely amazing. Uh, but it, it's more of these teen issue stories that we have talked about all along today that are coming out as new origin stories um, and not necessarily connected to comics, but in the graphic novels moving forward. What, what you'll notice is that the big two have recognized that there is a significant market in middle grades, graphic novels, and as a result are taking characters that have uh, a, a bit more cultural relevance and that are household names, partnering them with the writers and cranking out like YA, like middle grade stories. So Teen Titans, every Teen Titan is getting a, is getting a middle grade graphic novel. Um, uh, Valiant just partner Faith is getting a middle grade graphic novel. Um, whether these are as substantial as the independent works that pioneer the middle grade graphic novel boom, we will see. Um, but they are there. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we will see that. Uh, I, from behind the scenes, and I'm not that far behind the scenes, uh, DC is really making a, cons a concerted, sincere, and genuine effort to come up against these independent titles that are not within the big two and really bring similar, if not better, issues. I think the authors and the illustrators that they're engaging are on a much higher level than some of the independent stuff. Uh, and then they're being asked to do these new origin stories that deal with issues of 21st century children and YA readers. Guys, we have come to our stopping point. I want to thank you both for being a part of this. Uh, you are beautiful people, beautiful humans, and I am so glad that we got to share this time together. I'd like to thank all of the attendees. Um, be looking in your uh, email boxes next week. You will receive a list of titles that deal with uh, tough topics. Oh, we have one more question, but we don't actually, it just says thank you very much. Thank you, Gil. Um, and I hope everyone has a beautiful day. Thank you so much. You too. Nice mm -hmm. to see you guys. Yeah, you too. Bye, guys. <laughs>